Welcome everybody. Um, we're very excited to be here, my colleagues and I, for Open Day at the University of Sydney. I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. We are meeting here today in various places, but we're all meeting on land that belongs to First Nations people, which was never ceded. And we pay our really sincere and honest respects to their elders past, present and emerging. With that said, that important thing said, let me say it's a real delight to be with you all. We can't see you, so it's, you know, the usual strange COVID environment. Uh, my name's Catherine Lumby, and I'm a professor of media studies. And I'll just tell you something very quick about me because it kind of will give you a bit of an idea of how you might end up, what you might end up doing when you finish the media and communications degree at Sydney University, or perhaps you study uh, as a major digital cultures. Uh, and I'll tell you about how you can do electives in digital cultures if you enrol in the BA and BA advanced studies, media and communications degree. So my background is I studied at Sydney University. I did an arts law degree in the eighties, which is kind of carbon dating myself, I guess, a long time ago. And instead of becoming a lawyer, I became a journalist. So I worked in print and television. I went to the Sydney Morning Herald and I worked largely writing about politics and human rights. Uh, and then I went and worked at the ABC as a TV reporter. Um, and that was a pretty exciting time in the media. Um, it was a very different kind of media in those days, uh, but the media still exists. And I'll tell you a bit of bit more about that. And then I went off to New York and worked in the media as a freelancer there, freelancing for Australia and American organisations. So in 2000, I was asked to set up the media and communications degree. So I was the first chair of department. And the philosophy that I brought to it still underpins the structure of the program and the way it's taught. And that foundational principle is about bringing together theory and practice. What we do in media and communications is we bring ideas together with professional practice. We make things, we do things, but we think about why we're doing them and what the purpose of them is in the real world and what the public interest of what we do is. So in the media and communications degree, which is a four year degree, you will have the opportunity to study very important theoretical areas like media ethics and law, or the history of media studies, which is a discipline in its own right. Uh, you can, so you can study theoretical subjects, you know, the globalization of the media, the role of digital cultures, the digitization of the media, the emerging media landscapes, which are now constantly evolving, as we all know. Uh, so we can study things like that. You can get to think and talk about, for instance, what does it mean to be media producers as well as media consumers or users? Because back in the 80s and 90s, when I was a journalist, you could write a letter to the Sydney Morning Herald, but you certainly weren't making your own media and distributing it as we do obviously every day on social media or the internet. So we can talk about those kinds of things and about how that impacts the importance and role of the media. But at the same time, and very excitingly, I think students always get engaged with this at undergraduate level, you'll be learning audio skills, video skills, social media skills, writing skills, researching skills, uh, and you have the opportunity to do a major, which, and a minor, uh, which means that you can have a, you can study in a concentrated way something as fabulous as religious studies or English or performance studies or uh, politics or economics, or as my 21 year old son Charlie's doing, you could study classics. Um, all of these things are, are important, not just because they give you information about a subject, but because in the humanities, what we do is we, and my colleagues and I all do this, is we are teaching people to think critically. We're asking them to ask questions. We are getting them to 
uh, learn the arts of persuasion and rhetoric. We are asking them to research and to, and to, and to work out how you can make a good argument. Um, you know, we're living in an era where opinion seems to be substituted for fact all the time. We, we train people to distinguish fact and opinion. So all of the generic skills you learn in the humanities, communication skills, they're all germane to media and communications. So I think the exciting thing about the Sydney degree is you get the opportunity to be exposed to fantastic humanities subjects. And in fact, indeed, move into other faculties if you wish to do that. But the humanities, which I'm passionate about, I think is an area that gives you these foundational skills. And I'll just finish by saying this, that um, now it's attributed to Yeats, who's a poet, but it may not be Yeats, there's some dispute here. And he said, education is not the filling of a pail, it's the lighting of a fire. And that's what I and my colleagues all aspire to. So thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. And uh, and indeed, I'm now going to take over for a, a five minutes or so. My name's Mark Ledbury. I'm coming to you. I'm um, on unceded Gadigal land today, and I would like to pay my respect to Gadigal elders past, present and emerging. And because I'm an art historian, I'm going to show you some pictures. OK, so I'm just going to try to see whether this works. I hope it will. Uh, let me see. Uh, if it, if it is actually going to work, it should about now start to work. Great, so uh, this also give you a quick rundown of whoever, who else is on, but I'm gonna say a little about art history and film studies today, um, because in, our, in the art history department, we have majors in both art history and in film studies. Um, though I'm, I'm an art historian by training, we have had a wonderful and productive and extremely friendly a relationship with our film studies colleagues who work with us in the same department. So what do we do in art history? Many of you will, of course, have had an inkling of what that is if you've been taking art for HSC and you've done um, cultural or history parts of that, and you may have done film studies as part of indeed of English HSC, but, in, but the idea of certainly art history at Sydney is that we attempt to plunge you deeply into the breadth and depth of world art traditions. We have a very globally focused art history degree. We have, of course, uh, this includes the, the Western canon that we all know uh, and, uh, and uh, from you know, of Renaissance art, et cetera. But it also includes, we have, we have an expert on Islamic art, the long traditions of Islamic art on staff. And we also have indigenous uh, scholars teaching the long history of uh, uh, Australian indigenous art. Art history is really, uh, become a, a, an infinitely more rich discipline over the last 30 years in terms of the breadth of traditions that are studied and studyable by undergraduates. We also have a very uh, uh, active tradition in, in Sydney, particularly of the overlaps between the still and the moving image. And of course, there's a history of the complexity of the animated image, which goes all the way from Chauvet Cave through, uh, you know, uh, through um, from, so in other words, from the very beginnings of, uh, of human art making to, uh, this is of course Mybridge is one of Mybridge's famous study and, and there goes Cary Grant. And uh, so in other words, these are ways that we actually overlap and from the first year in your 1002 course, you will take on the relationship between the still and the moving image. And in film studies, uh, which of course has a sort of 130 year odd span uh, and some roots, uh, we, we try again to encompass not only uh, a global tradition of filmmaking, which goes of, of you know, classics of Hollywood cinema, and of course, but then also um, uh, Korean, Asian cinema, uh, Eastern European cinema, we have experts on many different forms of uh, and, and genres of filmmaking and national traditions. But we also think about the film world, the world that is not just directors and uh, you know, famous movies, but also the, 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 the system of Hollywood, the system of stars, the, who gets left out, who isn't, you know. So obviously someone like Sonia Levine, this what a fantastic pioneer of screenwriting in early Hollywood cinema and uh, uh, Russian Jewish immigrant into Hollywood. These are people that perhaps 
uh, sort of auteur centered theories of film, which you may have come across, wouldn't normally wouldn't normally embrace. But we we have an active uh, we seek actively to explore what film culture means. Now, one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, hallmarks of studying art, particularly at the University of Sydney uh, in, in our art history degree now is from right through the degree from first year through third year and fourth year, if you take a advanced studies degree is that we try to give you as much experience of art museums, objects, artworks, in situ, on site uh, with, with artworks. That's, um, that's become a hallmark. We have a fieldwork course in third year, obviously suspended in the last year or so, but we're hoping to get that up and running. And we also have the Chow Chak Wing Museum on site. This is a phenomenal, this is brand new as of last year. This is the very best uh, University Art Museum in Australia, and it has reactivated object-based learning across a wide range of disciplines. You can, uh, we, uh, our second year core course takes place right in the object teaching rooms with objects, with a wide variety of objects. And these are new opportunities that really enrich uh, student life and engagement with, with art and its, and its histories and theories. And of course, the other great addition to what recently to campus is SCA is joining us. We have artists thinking, writing and making on campus. Uh, Julie Raff and Sani Mestrum here are just two of the numerous stars and you'll hear a little bit more about SCA, but it really enriches how we work with the visual image in, on our campus and all students will have the chance to engage with that. Uh, it's not just about art making, it's about the way that artists think and that thinking that comes to, to campus. And obviously we're also, as, as, as Catherine was saying, we are pride ourselves on deep and long traditions of humanities research and thinking. And our staff are actively engaged in research and that research guides the kind of courses they teach, the kind of enthusiasms that they muster in students all the way from first year to honors and beyond. And these are just a number of uh, books that have been published by uh, my, my colleagues in the department very recently um, across a breadth of um, um, uh, the, the sort of the ideas and theories of, of in global art. And I just want to say before I finish, people often ask me what's next and you might, you know, and we have often been approached, we say, well, what, what could you do with these degrees? And in fact, what I'd say is that there's been an enormous amount that people could do with across the sort of visual world from marketing to, and all kinds of engagements. But, but we have obviously had a very uh, strong track record of uh, training people who go on to work in both academic and art writing settings. So this is Sumin Shim, one of our recent graduates who's going off to do further study on Korean art and feminism. This is Sebastian Smee, the Pulitzer Award, award winning uh, art critic for the Boston Globe and now the Washington Post. Uh, Jackie Strecker, who's a director of uh, uh, the um, Museum of Applied Art Sydney, a chief curator there. And Blair French, who's chief executive of Carry Work. All art history, uh, art history film studies uh, alum from our department and there are many more. The art world, the cultural world is rich with opportunities for those, the critical thinkers and the critical doers that art history and film studies produces. So I just want to reassure everybody that this, it, it, there are fantastic opportunities in our highly visually tuned world for people who have critically thought about how we see. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Um, that was fantastic. Um, my name's Hugh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what it means to study English at the University of Sydney. And like Mark, I have got a slide to show you. So welcome to the University of Sydney. Um, I wish I could see you all, uh, but I'll, I'll just imagine you smiling back at me. Uh, my name's Hugh. I work at the English department here at the University of Sydney. Um, at open days like this, we often get asked questions, as Mark was just saying, perfectly understandable questions about why study things like English or the arts more broadly. And I guess in particular, why study arts and the humanities at Sydney University? These are seemingly sensible, simple and understandable questions, but there are no easy answers to that, I think. Uh, you have to follow your instincts a little when it comes to this kind of thing. And mine tells me that literature, writing, engaging the world through thoughtful and provocative writing is more crucial than ever. Sometimes when I work, um, 
preparing some teaching or thinking about how to uh, approach students and so on, I have this quote in front of me, uh, reminding me that even if I'm doing something really dull, like a meeting on a Thursday afternoon, about the seriousness and also the joy of what it is that we do here with literature at the University of Sydney. The great American writer, Toni Morrison, and she writes, there's no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That's how civilizations heal. And we don't have time. The world is a very tricky place, especially right now for many of us. But some of us, not all of us probably, but some of us are going to make things better by thinking, by writing and communicating. So that might sound a bit grandiose, a kind of grandiose pep talk. So how does that work uh, when you're actually doing English at the University of Sydney? And I thought the best way is really just to take you on a kind of whistle stop tour through some of the things that we do at each stage with our students. So in first year, if you're an English major, you do two subjects. Um, and these are the kinds of choices that you have. So we always have a creative writing choice. So if you are a budding writer, there's always a choice to do creative writing at every stage of your degree. Uh, but we also cover other things right from the first year. So going way back in time to medieval literature and then forward to the present, engaging with global literatures in English right across the world. And also thinking about what it means to study classic literary texts. And then when it comes on to the second year of your English major, then we really get going with some kind of hard hitting discipline specific knowledge around the novel. So novel worlds around big questions like postmodernism and again, creative writing. And we also have um, a core unit at our second year called the life of texts, which we really think of as the heart of what we do here at the University of Sydney in the English department. It deals with the liveliness of texts, the way that literary texts move around the world move around different cultures. My job in that unit is to uh, talk to students about um, very old texts, 400 year old books that we have here at the Fisher Library. And when you um, arrive at the University of Sydney, we'll actually go down to the library and handle these 400 year old books, very rare early Shakespeare editions. And we'll think about the journeys that they've been on, the meanings that people make with them over time the kind of fragmentary traces of texts as they kind of travel around the world. Um, and then when it comes to your third year, this is just a, a series of examples here, then you usually do three options in your major. And in English, that would be from a whole range of very specific things that you might be interested in. So again, I teach the Shakespeare one because that's what I do, but there's other things. So the Brontes, if you're interested in specific authors or uh, African-American literature, if you're interested in American literature and so on. So we get really specific in the third year. Um, just to give you some sense of what it might be like to be an English student, I'm just gonna play you a short video. It's only a minute long, so I won't go over my time. Um, Studying English here has really allowed me to understand that English is asking really big questions. You know, what is time? What's history? What's experience? Um, and so it's the real intellectual rigor and kind of passion that it's enlivened in me that's been really great. We're the largest department in the country. And so we're lucky in the sense that we have the broadest range of expertise, both in terms of uh, research and teaching. So we have internationally res uh, respected researchers. We have nationally respected teachers. At the moment, I have a creative writing project that I'm doing, um, which is amazing and it's so much fun. And I'm learning so much from it because I'm able to keep a writing journal and use observations from my daily life and uh, to actually practice um, being creative. You're exposed to texts that you may not otherwise encounter. And through doing that, you are exposed to um, ideas, um, places, um, cultures, perspectives that uh, one may not otherwise see. Um, it's an opportunity to be open to ideas. I'm currently working at Aeon in their graduate program, specialising in consulting, particularly doing honours in English literature, really prepared me uh, to be a critical thinker, uh, to not just read things at face value, but to delve deeper. Oh, 
Okay, so to summarize, here at English, uh, you said um, you'll meet world reading, world leading researchers teaching you, and whatever you're interested in in terms of literature, we're probably likely to cover it, whether that's novels, poetry, drama, or film, whether it's from the UK, from America, from Australia, or from around the world. And also, if you're interested in creative writing, uh, we also have a place for you here as well. There are a number of ways you can get in touch with us, and I'd encourage you to do that. There's a website from the university. Uh, we're also on Twitter and on Facebook as well. So uh, feel free to get in touch with us uh, through any of those channels, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Well, that was wonderful. Um... Hugh, it's, it's, it's a real joy, actually, open days when you're a staff member. It's, it's great to hear from your fellow staff members about their disciplines. I think a bit, I'm going to go old school like you, um, Professor Lumby, and I'll, I've got a slideshow. It's very snazzy, maybe not quite as snazzy as the English department slideshow, but I think I'll just go old school. I'm talking to you from my son's bedroom, but uh, he's very messy like most teenagers, so I've got a virtual backdrop here. That's the Rex Cramphorn Studio, which is one of our teaching spaces in the Department of Theatre and Performance Studies, where I'm the chair. And we use that space sometimes for students to create their own work. Uh, but often, very often, it's a space where professional artists and residents come. And so I think I'll just start with that question. I often get asked by students who've maybe done drama for their high school studies, like my two boys have done drama, and they say, is it going to be like drama? And I say, yes and no. <laughs> and so the, the yes part of that is, you know, there will be many subjects which would be familiar to anyone who's done drama or who studied drama within English or, or history or other subject areas at high school. Um, you know, like I'm teaching a course at the moment, which is about how to analyse live theatrical performance. And so if we weren't in COVID, that would involve, you know, going on uh, visits to the theatre and, um, uh, you know, watching shows and, you know, really doing a thorough analysis, not just of the written play text, but of all the other kind of uh, elements of the staging, you know, costume, sets, design, a gesture and so forth. But in order to prepare a student for that kind of analytical work, obviously we have to use practice as a teaching tool. So sometimes you might walk past my classroom and it would look like a, a dance class or a movement class, training class. And it's not really like we, we're not doing vocational level training. It's not NIDA, okay? It's not um, the Victorian College of the Arts. It's not the West Australian Academy of Performing Arts. Uh, but generally, if a student is taking theatre and performance studies, that would be one strand, either a major strand or a minor strand within a generalist degree. And so, you know, you might see me or my colleagues for three hours a week. So we're not going to train you to be a professional actor in that time. But we can certainly give you a sensitivity towards practice. You can learn through practice and then you can take that into your analytical work. Maybe if I give another example, I have a colleague, uh, Dr. Laura Ginters, who's teaching a unit of study called dramaturgy. So it's about the crafting of plays. And when she teaches that unit, she has artists in residence. And so in a couple of weeks time, we'll have Mughalan Performing Arts Company, one of the nation's leading First Nations uh, companies will be workshopping a new play and they're going to do it on Zoom this year, obviously. And the students are like, you know, um, flies on the wall, I suppose. They're sitting in the room with a professional writer, director, the dramaturg, actors, giving this writer feedback on the earliest first draft of a script. And then at the end, the students will receive the final draft of the script and their essay question will be, okay, explain to me the logic of the dramaturgical changes that this script has been through. So it's an analytical essay, but the, 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 the research that you need to do that analytical essay is not in Fisher Library primarily, it's in the practice that you observed and you were in the room. So that's kind of the relationship we have to practice. We teach a little bit through practice, but modestly, not vocational level training. And then we give you opportunities to engage with professional practitioners and to, and to learn from, from watching closely. And sometimes we get to do workshops with those artists in residence as well. I think the other thing I probably need to say very quickly is that there's, there's a lot in the title. So theatre and performance studies. So 
theatre with a capital T, you know, the kinds of practices that you might be familiar with from going to places like Belvoir Street or Griffin Theatre Company or Sydney Theatre Company or whatever. That's certainly core business for us. But the reason why we also include the term performance in the title is we're interested in things like how people perform identity in everyday life. We're interested in performance art. We're interested in site-specific performance or protest actions could be considered a form of performance. My own research has involved traveling to the autonomous region of Bougainville in Papua New Guinea and studying reconciliation ceremonies through which communities are trying to repair a society that went through a civil war. So that's kind of almost an anthropology project, yeah? So it's performance can be taken in a very broad sense. And I would say that our units, you know, it kind of breaks down as about two thirds of what we do is kind of theatre with a capital T and maybe one third of what we do is engaging with performance in a much broader notion. So it's very practice engaged. It's not vocational training, but I can say amongst our graduates, you know, like there's a lot of very seriously talented artists. Um, the new artistic director of the Melbourne Theatre Company is someone I taught not so many years ago. There's lots of playwrights and professional actors. They'll tend to go, those people will tend to go on and do vocational training after their Bachelor of Arts degree. Um, but there's also, you know, like people study theatre and performance studies for the sheer intellectual thrill of it, for all the generic skills that any of these wonderful disciplines that my colleagues teach will also give you. There's a lot of drama teachers also who we would um, train. I think that's probably enough. I don't want to eat into my colleagues' time. So I think I'm passing on to Professor Carol Cusack uh, in Studies and Religion. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, I do have uh, a PowerPoint. So I'm going to um, share it because even though it's not as snazzy as Hughes, I think it's probably a good idea. And can everyone see now? Yes? Cool. Right. I'm here to talk to you about studies in religion at the University of Sydney. My name is Carol Cusack. I'm a professor of religious studies. And naturally, I think what I do is tremendously interesting, and I'm hoping maybe I'll be able to convince you this. I'm sitting, like many of my colleagues at home, because we can't really go anywhere else, and my kitchen is on unceded Gadigal land, and I pay respects to the elders of the Gadigal people of the Eunora Nation, past, present, and future. Why should you study religion? Many people think perhaps it's a bit irrelevant. Uh, we've just gone through the census for 2021 in the month of August, and everybody probably knows that the big news of the 2016 census was that no religion had become the largest religious group in Australia. Of course, it wasn't quite true. If you put all the Christian denominations together, there were still 51% of people who said they were Christians, but there are very significant divisions there. And no religion at a monumental whacking 30% was fairly impressive. But one of the strange things about people with no religion is that they might still consider themselves to be spiritual. And they're certainly interested in human meaning and in the purpose of life. And studying religion, if you extend the idea of institutional formal religion to include more personal and more eclectic spiritualities, these things are core to human life, to the making of meaning, um, to celebrating and commemorating, to be able to put a shape and a frame to the wonder of living, the hope that we feel even when things are very, very dark. And religion's a multidisciplinary activity. You won't find that my colleagues all come from the same sort of academic background or even have the same interests or perspectives. We absolutely don't. But you can study religion through history and sociology, through archeology span and anthropology. You can study ancient world, medieval, contemporary, mediated, pop cultural, postmodern, any of these particular forms. And so we try to offer a very broad, um, and very wide ranging set of options for students. Now this is very dull and I feel this shows that I'm really no 
PowerPoint goddess, I have simply put onto this slide what you need to do if you're going to do a major and a minor in religious studies. Um, a major is when you start in first year and you carry your studies through to third year. And so you do 1000 level first year, 2000 level second year, 3000 level third year units. In a minor, you don't do as much study um, and you can therefore fit it perhaps in if you're going to do a major in something else that you're very interested in or passionate about. Religion's very compatible with many different uh, subject areas in the faculty and it often is a very appealing minor, I think, for students. And so I've given you on this slide uh, a little bit of a range of what I've told you we teach in terms of how varied and different our first year units, the first 1002 religion, text, life and tradition is basically a historical unit. And it looks at the religions that are commonly called the world religions, the big ones, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the three big monotheisms, Buddhism and Hinduism, and some of the other religions that are contextualized around the historical emergence of those traditions. If you look at the second year units, um, we have some that are about substantive areas. So RLST 2624, the birth of Christianity is a historical unit and it's about a specific religion. But we have others that are very broad ranging, for example, like philosophy of religion, which doesn't limit itself to one religion, but looks at the way philosophy operates in many. When we get to third year, there's a great deal of difference in the units uh, offered in the sense that some are kind of about ideas, they're more philosophical or methodological. Some are about specific traditions, very popular one, for example, um, 3604, ancient Egyptian religion and magic gets very strong uh, enrollments because people are very interested in ancient Egypt and magic is an attractive subject too. And you see also that there's a couple of um, codes in there that aren't RLST because we do share units with people in other departments such as Hebrew, Biblical and Jewish studies departments that have affinities or affiliations with us. And so to finish up, I think that it's not really a difficult question, way to, question to answer why should we study religion. Religion's interesting, relevant, profound, and it will enrich your life. I'm absolutely sure of that. It's intimately connected with just about every domain of human life, art, literature, ethics, the way society is organized, ideas about personal and community identity. So it's a vital tool needed to understand human beings and the kind of world that they've created. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Carol. I'm uh, next uh, speaker. My name's Oliver. I'm an academic at Sydney College of the Arts, which is the art school at the University of Sydney. I'll just bring up my PowerPoint here. Okay, so uh, <coughs> SCA has a uh, proud history dating back to 1974 and uh, more recently, we've relocated to the Camperdown campus. So it's, uh, it's been a wonderful uh, progression for the uh, art school. Uh, the academics that teach there are leading artists uh, supported by technicians. We have fabulous uh, studio facilities that we're itching to get into uh, once we get past this current situation. Um, but don't let that put you off. Uh, lots of great classes are being delivered on Zoom uh, at the moment, which I'm sure uh, across many other departments as well. We've got a couple of major, uh, well, a couple of uh, key undergraduate offerings, the Bachelor of Visual Arts. So that's our specialist degree in which uh, half of your study load will be made up of units where you're in the studio. You also undertake a series of art history units and there's room uh, in the remaining uh, parts of the degree to either take up another major within the Bachelor of Advanced Studies or to undertake further studio elective units 
that may complement uh, the other work you do in the major area. You can also do a visual arts major, which is made up of two foundation uh, units and then the uh, electives that I mentioned further uh, before. And then we have further study in uh, honours and postgraduate levels. Within the BVA, as we uh, call it, the first year is a foundation year in which you'll uh, be exposed to a whole range of uh, approaches to creative practice. In second year, you select a particular area of emphasis. So the lists there, ceramics, glass, jewelry, painting, photo media, print media, screen arts and sculpture. And you continue with that uh, area of uh, emphasis as your uh, launch pad in third year when you work towards a degree show exhibition. So the Bachelor of Visual Arts, as I mentioned, can operate within the Bachelor of Advanced Studies, enabling you to undertake a major in another area as well, which is very attractive to students. Uh, entry is a particular pathway in with a portfolio, uh, as well as the ATAR. So a, check out the details there, but don't be put off by that. It's really about demonstrating potential. Essentially 10 artworks are placed in a slide room in a short statement and then uh, Myself or one of my colleagues will view that and uh, see uh, if you're suitable, but it's really something that we encourage you to see as a curatorial project and reviewing your own practice to date. So there's particular sort of uh, milestones leading towards uh, the final application. And a lot of this information you can uh, gain from the uh, various resources online. And we have a couple of entry schemes that you might like to be aware of that can be attractive as well. I'm quite aware of time here today, so I might leave it at that and stop the share because we've got uh, a period for just general Q&A at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to all of you for all of our speakers today. Um, so Sam and I have been busily answering some questions um, from you in the Q&A box. Uh, but what I might do now is um, read out a few of the ones that I thought would be great for um, our panel here today to answer live. Um, so thank you for sending them through. There are some really great questions here in the chat. Um, I might start here with a question. Um, there were a few questions actually um, around theatre and performance studies. Um, so a question for you, Paul, um, about... Uh, whether or not it's more theoretical than it is practical. Um, there were some questions about whether it includes dance and pantomime specifically. Um, could you speak a little about that? Sure, the, the, the great questions. Um, dance, I have a colleague who's a dance historian and a former dancer and a creative producer of dance. However, I think she would agree with me to say that, um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of dance in what we teach. It's primarily, it's um, theatre, theatrical, theatre-based performance or other forms of performance art, is, it would be the main focus. Um, yeah, and so, so the students in, who take theatre and performance studies who have an interest in dance, they tend to satisfy their dance lust by joining a dance society, you know, a student-run society on campus. The thing about practical, I want to be really clear about this. You know, I would, I would be resentful if any university theatre or drama department said they're training people vocationally. That's, you know, I, I respect the skills of professional theatre makers. And if you want to be an actor prefer working professionally in theatre, film or TV, there's very, very few people who get anywhere in the business if they haven't gone and done a three-year vocational training course at a place like NIDA or the Victorian College of the Arts. But everyone in our department has professional experience. I'm working professionally in the theatre myself. The, behind me, the virtual background is, you know, from rehearsals for a show I just directed for the Sydney Festival in 2021. That's where we are, we're in 2021, aren't we? And, you know, and that show's going to have a season next year, COVID willing at the Opera House and blah, blah, blah. So, so it is an extremely practice engaged department. We're working all the time with professional artists and we will, we, we use practice as a teaching method so maybe about 20% or 30% of your class time will be doing small scale practical activities, but it's not vocational training. It's a, it's, it's a way of sensitizing you to practice. Um, I think it's probably the best way I can answer that question. That's great. Thank you, Paul. 
Um, there's also a number of questions here, pretty much across all of your disciplines, asking about the various career opportunities um, that might be available to graduates. Um, so I might invite you all just to say a little bit about that from each of your perspectives for your disciplines. Um, perhaps we could start with you, Mark. Um, okay. Oh, am I muted? No, nope, no. we can hear you. I'll get you can hear me. Good. Um, well, look, obviously, I, I did mention that there is a pathway from being really interested in the study of history of art or film studies into pragmatic things like being a film or art curator. I would I want to emphasize that that usually involves a quite a complex path, sometimes involving doing a master's. We have masters in art curating and in museum and heritage studies, uh, or it might involve what many, because um, I saw there was a question in the chat about pragmatic, we don't teach filmmaking as an art. We do, we're not uh, a filmmaker school, but as you will also know, many filmmakers started as film students and by having the opportunity, maybe even through uh, work that they do, for example, on our Master of Moving Image, they could take a master's later, or just by getting involved in filmmaking one way or the practically around the campus, which many opportunities exist to do, they start to make their own student films, etc. Uh, but we, uh, I think as Catherine so eloquently and Carol so eloquently said, we, we exist in the humanities frame where we're teaching people to think and analyze critically. That, as you know, it's it's, it's, it's how Goddard and co started as film critics, as film watchers, as critical film watchers, which led them into their film practice. That's probably the way that most people who come down to our uh, degree and our majors will get their start as thinkers and readers and lookers first, and then as maybe going on to more pragmatic things later. So, um, you know, because the short answer to the question in the chat about whether we teach filmmaking in our film studies degree, no, we don't. But um, it's a, but but many of the people that do take our degrees, one way or another, end up in some form of film production or film-related career. That may be organizing a festival, it may be in production, it may be in design. Thank you, Mark. I might move across from there to Oliver. Um, I know that SCA does offer some screen arts and at postgrad level, um, a moving image degree. Perhaps you could share a little bit about that along the film production um, question. Yeah, great. Uh, so certainly there is a pathway through the Master of Moving Image, our uh, postgraduate coursework offering for people to move towards a uh, career in uh, film uh, related areas. And many aspects of what we teach at SCA uh, center on the student becoming a creative practitioner or a contemporary artist. And I think I'd uh, come back to that list of uh, options in terms of the area of emphasis within the BVA. There's that whole range of uh, modes of uh, creative production, lots of different materials and processes supported. So that obviously can uh, translate directly into uh, working as an artist or perhaps uh, in uh, associated uh, areas of design and craft. And from that uh, cultural uh, production and the creative industries more broadly. And also I'd uh, talk about that link uh, to art history as well. So we've got uh, this idea that artists don't only make work, but they talk about making work and they're involved in the uh, dialogue and uh, exchange of ideas in that sense also. Thank you, Oliver. Um, I just wanted to continue on with the question about um, various career opportunities um, in the other disciplines as well. Um, so I might circle back to Hugh, um, if you could answer that question from your department's perspective too. Thanks, Gillian. Um, I mean, I guess I just uh, agree with Mark that what we do in English and in creative writing is within a kind of humanities framework. And so we're teaching people to think analyze. Uh, but my other way of answering that question when people ask me is usually just to think about all the people that I know that I've taught in the last few years and the millions of different jobs they've done. So just to list a few of them, got Guardian journalist, um, arts industry workers, um, politicians, unfortunately, we train those as well. Sorry. Um, uh, journalists, did I say journalists? <laughs> I <laughs> say journalists, lawyers, quite a few of those, uh, people who work in the arts industry. And recently also, I've been working with students who do internships as part of their degree. And I've been working with a student who's working for an international publishing house. Um, and in the future, we'll be doing internships for people who work on providing content for websites as well. 
So any kind of professional work that requires critical thinking, most people will do some measure of vocational training, either on the job or more formally after they finished a Bachelor of Arts. But it's the level of skill and analytical capability that you develop as a student here that really enables you to make the most of those like subsequent training opportunities. Thanks, Julian. Thank you, Hugh. Um, and I might move from there uh, to you, Catherine. The mention of journalism kind of made that connection for me. Um, so if you could share a little, bit, a little bit about what your alumni are up to. And there's also another question sure. in here which you may be able to answer, um, yes. which is asking about the um, fashion business marketing sector. Sure. I, can um, whether there's a connection I, with that I think I, I, I said yes to that. Oh. Um, <laughs> So the, the first thing I just want to say is I just want to support everything all my colleagues have been saying about, um, cert, I mean, I won't use the word traditional humanities, it's a silly word, the humanities generally, because media and communications is part of that. Um, I actually mark, I'm an alumnus of art history. So, you know, you may want to mark my file never to be released. But anyway, I did, a, I have a first class honours degree from your department. <laughs> my friend and so the, this is the thing I became a journalist you know there are a lot of things I could have done in life so I just want to say this generally to people who are listening you know and all my colleagues have said the same thing to me the foundation of a good undergraduate degree and I've said this to my children and other people's kids is just go out and get curious and learn you know, and I mean, all of these departments teach really important, interesting things. So that's the first thing. It's about igniting that passion. And as Paul was saying, and other people have said, you can add vocational things onto the top of it. Now in media and communications, the one thing I neglected to say is we have an internship and there wasn't a question about, well, what can I do with this degree? And I didn't mention that in my sort of initial talk. And I know that there are a lot of probably parents out there who say, oh, well, you, if you're not doing a law degree or a medical degree, you do a MECO degree because it's not just a, just a BA. Well, I completely reject that sort of logic, actually. <laughs> but we've incorporated BA into what we do. And we do have an internship in the final year, the fourth year. Um, and there are jobs, but they're not where you used to always see them like me wouldn't go straight to the Sydney Morning Herald though some people will or go to the ABC there are still those jobs but there's a really broad range of other things that you can do with that kind of degree and to come to the fashion question you know I mean many of you will be on social media probably all of you so you'll know about social media influences and, and with research you know this is the kind of stuff that some of us study like how is social media changing the world? How is it changing, going back to what Paul said about identity and performance of identity, and this is where there are connections across disciplines, what does it mean to perform identity when you're doing it virtually, which is what we're doing right now? So these questions are not ones that sit in little tight silos, but what my colleagues do crosses over into what my colleagues think about and we think about with them. And so the great thing about Sydney University and, you know, and Carol Cusack talking about religious studies, is there not a more important time to be looking at religious studies given what's happening in Afghanistan and the world? I think so. So all of these things are things that you can take out and then you can build vocationally on. I hope I've answered that question. Yes, that was wonderful. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I might redirect that now to you, Carol, um, if you could share a little bit about what your alumni are up to um, and some career opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Catherine, for the shout out too. Um, I'd just like to say that uh, the majority of our students often go into teaching, which I know a lot of people think is not a very exciting career, but there will always be schools and there will always be a need for teachers. And Studies of religion at school level is actually a very large subject. Um, around about 12,000 students do it every year and a very large number of skills offer it. So that's one set. All of my colleagues have talked about journalism or some form of professional writing. We've certainly had graduates go into the ABC and work on documentaries like Compass and other special 
um, programs that feature often religious stories. We've also had students go into radio as a result, similarly working in areas of religion, but also more broad meaning making questions. I've had students go into multicultural New South Wales, the government department that looks a lot at the mix of our society. However, I, I do save the best till last. With religious studies, there was this thing that was briefly known as the September 11 recovery, the largest first year in religious studies at the University of Sydney, and I've been here for 40 years, was um, um, 2002, when we had 300 people start in first year, partly because the events of September 11 were so completely bewildering. Since then, and I don't know if this is a sinister thing or not, one of the larger employers of our graduates has been DFAT. We have quite a lot of people working in Canberra, usually in security and foreign affairs and trade is, is what DFAT is, if you don't actually know what that um, um, acronym means. And, and certainly several of them are specifically doing intelligence work that involves specific and, and detailed knowledge of religions around the world. So that's been a little bit of a surprise. Um, one of our star alumni is actually a professor now at Macquarie University, and he's shifted very successfully from being a religious studies person to being policing intelligence and counterterrorism, which you know may be a bit of a dark note to end on, but it is relevant. Thank you, Carol. Um, and I think, Paul, we're over to you for the same question, please. It, it's, it's such a good question um, to ask. And it's not just parents who ask it. I think, you know, it, it, any young person in the world today is kind of thinking, OK, what pathways? Um, so there are some there are some very kind of practical choices that some of our students make. I would say roughly about a third of the students I teach, they're either doing a combined degree Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Education, or they're going to finish their arts degree and they might come back and do a Master's of Teaching. So that uh, there's a lot of teachers that I, I train or help train. I would say there's a, lot, there's a lot of people, you know, I could pull out a long list of alumni who have made a real mark in professional performing arts. Uh, the one thing I want, to say, I want to say two things about them. One is that they, they wanted it badly and they were savvy. And they, they got a lot of experience through amateur student drama, where the, we're lucky at Sydney University, we have the Sydney University Drama Society, which is actually a very well run student society. And so you can write your own shows, direct your own shows, design your own shows and everything. So they build up a portfolio. And then that might be the thing that helps them get their way into a place like NIDA, where they can get that extra level of professional vocational training they need. But I, I feel proud of some of those um, people have made an impact in performing arts because they, they do often come back to me and say, I remember your course about X. There's a famous Australian theatre director called Rex Cramphorn. And he said, what I would want from a university course in theatre and performance is not an understanding of what theatre is currently, but what it has been in other times and other places, what it could be in the future. And I, I feel that very strongly. Um, on a personal note, like I, there was a time in my life when I wanted to be an actor. Thank God I didn't succeed. I would be, you know, <laughs> I was I'm very wooden. Um, but bizarrely, you know, once I'd committed to being an academic, I suddenly got given opportunities to perform on the main stage of Belvoir Street Theatre because I was making these documentary theatre shows um, about you know, political theatre. And it, was, it all came from the fact that I had research skills. I had lecturing skills. So I knew how to talk to an audience and I had research skills. And I've, I've for the last 15 years, I've been making pieces of non-fiction theatre or documentary theatre that have toured nationally and internationally. So weird about that. Also DFAT, where, but uh, not so much working in um, the security and intelligence area, Professor Carol Cusack. Uh, the, our DFAT people tend to work in um, delivery of aid programs and things like that. Um, yeah, but the, so there's the generic skills that any discipline across the arts and humanities and social sciences will offer you. And so there's people I've taught who end up working in HR or the, you know, um, public servants, policy officers working in health department, that sort of thing. Um, but then there are probably more specifically the drama teachers um, 
and the theatre makers, performance makers. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Catherine, I believe you forgot to mention something earlier that you'd like to add. Yeah, I'm really good at asking questions as a journalist. I'm not very good at answering them. <laughs> and, and I apologise also, I've got a bit of a squeaky throat today. <clears throat> it's hay fever. So apologies for that. Um, so what I would say, because I didn't answer the question about alumni. So I'll, I'll illustrate it thusly, because we've had so many people going to really amazing places like the New York Times, the ABC, Sydney Morning Herald, but also more recently into major jobs in social media advertising, other areas, which, you know, broadly speaking, are called content provider areas. I hate that term. <laughs> it's, it's really not very poetic. But um, the other day, I, I, I continue to sort of work as a journalist. I write opinion columns for The Guardian. I'll be quick, Gillian, I can see the time. And, um, you know, and my editor, the opinion column editor there, is Joe Tovey, who I taught in 2002 in the, in the first, from first year. And um, she sent a column back to me. She went, oh, it's not very tightly written. <laughs> and I picked up the phone and laughed and I went, you're right. <laughs> so that's what I call success with alumnus and alumni, I mean, yes. Thank you, Catherine. Um, it's almost 2.30, but there was um, there were a few questions here uh, for you, Oliver, that would be great if you could give us an answer for. Um, they're about what the difference is between the Bachelor of Visual Arts and the major in Visual Arts, which you would do through another degree like the Bachelor of Arts. Could you um, tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, certainly. Uh, the way I'd describe it uh, is the Bachelor of Visual Arts, the BVA, is a de specialist degree in which half of your study load is made up of units which are focused on the studio. So you're working 50% of the time as an artist. And as I described in first year, you try a whole lot of approaches. Second year, you pick a particular area to focus on. And then third year, you work towards the degree exhibition as the culmination. Alongside the 50% of the time in the studio, you'll undertake a series of art history units. So that's the essence of the BVA. You can take it by itself and have room in the degree to then augment that with other studio electives. So you can spend even more time in the studio. Uh, and those other studio electives can be uh, aligned to your particular focus or the area of emphasis, whatever that might be. I went through that list. Or they can be a whole range of things and you can approach it more like a smorgasbord. So that's the BVA, a specialist visual arts degree. The visual arts uh, major is slightly different. It's built of six credit point units of study. Now this is a university uh, structures and terminology, but basically one six credit point unit is 25% of your study load. So a quarter of your time will be made up of uh, time in the studio essentially. We have two foundation units for the visual arts major, which expose you to a range of approaches to uh, creative practice, so 2D, 3D, 4D and XD. And we also then uh, link those two foundation units with the suite of electives. So all of the different studio processes that are supported in the elective units of study. So you can pick and choose uh, from amongst those units and then build either, again, more of a smorgasbord or interdisciplinary experience or focus on a particular mode of uh, creative practice. So it might be photography or film or painting that is your interest and in the visual arts major within the second and third year, you can uh, pursue that. So that's it in a nutshell. BVA, 50% of the time in the studio, visual arts major, more modular and a, more flexible because it's more modular. That's great. Thank you, Oliver. Um, well, we're sadly out of time, but we have managed to get through all of the questions um, in the Q&A box, which was a fantastic effort. Um, so very um, big thanks to all of our um, panelists, academic um, colleagues today, and also thanks to, to you for coming along to Open Day and watching um, this presentation. We hope to see you next year. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, everyone.